Our second framing speaker will be Professor Srinath Reddy. Professor Reddy is president of the Public Health Foundation of India, the leading such institution in India, an institution committed to capacity building in public health throughout that country through education, training, research, policy development, health communication, and advocacy. Professor Reddy has a remarkable record of academic and scientific achievement and of service, but to give you a sense of the man, I'd like to call out four of those items because they tell a story together. He was president of the World Heart Federation. He recently chaired the high-level expert group on universal health coverage in India. He serves on the leadership council of the Sustainable <coughs> Development Solutions Network at the UN, and he is a member of the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition. Did you catch that? Cardiology, universal health care, sustainability, and food. If you've ever met more of a systems thinker than Professor Reddy, I'd like to know about it. <laughs> Professor Reddy, welcome to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. The relationship between climate and health has moved miles from the realm of speculative science to lived reality. We meet at a time when the codependence of climate, health, and indeed all of human development is abundantly evident from the sweep of sound science to experiential awareness generated by a surge of public health emergencies. We also meet at a time when common knowledge and common sense are confounded and confronted by denial, distortion, and deliberate obstruction of climate action. We therefore need to position health prominently in the climate discourse and propel climate action within and through the health sector. The influence of climate on human health and the impact of climate change on a wide range of health outcomes needs to be made much more widely known within our profession and well beyond that into the wider community. The effects extend not only across the entire life course of every human on earth from preconception to terminal illness, but through the entire ecosystem of this planet, which is thrown into disarray. We have been told again today about the extreme weather events, the intolerable heat, the surge in vector-borne diseases, where as humans lie listless in heat, the mosquitoes become athletic and climb to high altitudes, <laughs> and the impact on cardiovascular and neuropsychiatric effects Indeed, even we have scientific evidence now of how increase in temperature escalates interpersonal as well as intergroup conflicts. Not only we grow hot in the environment, we grow hot under the collar. And we also recognize, as has been clearly pointed out, that we are not only talking about health, we are talking about nutrition, which is integral to health. And we are talking about the impact of climate change on agriculture and food systems, which indeed are related in a mutually detrimental fashion or a mutually synergistic fashion. We are at an era where some of the distortions in agriculture and food systems are actually accelerating climate change. And that impact of climate change on agricultural productivity and the nutrient quality of the foods that we produce is also substantially altered. For every one degree centigrade rise in temperature, the production of staples in sub-Saharan Africa as well as South Asia goes down by 10%. And not only the nutrient quality of staples is altered, but of non-staples is also altered, so that when we are talking about diverse diets being essential for human health, we recognize that climate change poses a terrible threat. And at the same time, the manner in which we get into livestock production are very intense agricultural methods, as well as the food processing systems are also increasing greenhouse gas emissions and accelerating climate change. 
And this is not only impacting upon our external environment with our knowledge of the microbiome, the internal environment, the quality of the nutrients and the quality of the foods that we take is going to be altering the way in which the super genome of the human being as well as the microbiome work together to protect and promote human health. So the consequences are indeed tremendous. And the realization that the lifeline of human health extends from the pulse to the planet is something that we must universalize. Certainly, we recognize that there are health impacts, there are social impacts of social disruption, and economic impact. But even as we make the case by measuring some of these impacts, and certainly the case, it's been argued that we must make a convincing business case to let the politicians and the policymakers and the economists make a very clear-cut commitment to climate action. We must recognize that all of the costs cannot be well quantitated. For example, how do we quantitate the effect of steadily rising temperatures on physical inactivity and in turn on a variety of non-communicable diseases? If a superb athlete like Roger Federer wills and chokes in the unseasonal heat of New York, what of the people who are supposed to be doing physical activity on a routine basis outside? What about our children in the playgrounds? So there are areas that we have to press, not merely from the point of view of cogent economic arguments, but raising the issue of rights and ethics. So air pollution is an important element which we must certainly pursue, as we have been reminded this morning, because the common pathways that climate change and air pollution share opens the conversation in an era where we are feeling certainly threatened by increasing air pollution. But e-waste could be the new plastic. So we need conversations about that as well. But we are not here to catalyze the coming catastrophe with increasing precision. We are here to forge a common commitment for concerted action. And how do we do that? We position climate in all policies. Just as we were argued for health in all policies, we now need to position climate in all policies, including health, from energy to education, from transport to housing, from agriculture to food processing, and of course, across the entire health system. So we need to move from healthcare without harm to green healthcare as the norm. And when we are talking about the health system, the health system certainly should act as the role models of change in the use of renewable energy the reduction of emissions. We must adopt environment-friendly procurement systems, demonstrate that we can walk the talk. And we are doing that to some extent in India, where we have established a health and environment leadership platform, which now has more than 6,000 hospitals as members who are practicing the transformation of hospitals into green hospitals. We need also to develop climate resilient healthcare facilities which can stand up to the test of public health emergencies which not only throw the wider population into danger but also imperil the efficiency of the healthcare system itself as care providers. But we must also recognize that we are not merely there to provide care after the event. We must act as trusted messengers who can influence public opinion and thinking in the area of climate action. We must use every opportunity of interaction to educate patients, families, and communities. A message that can easily be shared, not in a paternalistic, pompous manner, but in a very partnership mode, that we are here committed to protect your health. Are you committed also to protect the health of the planet. So what we need to do is to use our influence as trusted messengers to convert all those we come into contact with to become planet healers. So we do need in this process to raise concerns but not provoke despair, to inspire resolve but not resignation. Certainly there are methods in which we ought to use the health sector proactively to influence our own behaviors within the health sector and use public policy and public financing much more effectively. 
For example, we now recognize that primary health care and universal health coverage have become very important elements in the global public health agenda. And there is an offers an opportunity as countries, especially in the low and middle income countries like India, are now raising the amount of public financing to try and provide universal health coverage. There is an opportunity for the government not only to spend on public health care facilities in which they will definitely be investing, hopefully, but also for contracted private sector to be mandated to have green technologies and adopt environmentally friendly norms and procurement systems. Therefore, for example, now India is launching a fairly ambitious uh, program of uh, financial protection for persons who require hospitalization in secondary or tertiary care who are particularly economically disadvantaged. And that's going to require a fair amount of collaboration between the public and the private sectors. There is no reason why, along with all the other accreditation criteria of the capacity to deliver competent health care, we also cannot introduce certain environmental norms as a must. And those can be important nudges for behavior change. And public policy can be a very effective instrument. It can be both an incentive as well as a regulator. A carrot and a stick. A frozen carrot, if you please, which can be both a carrot and a stick. <laughs> so as we try and advocate action for change, we need to build coalitions. Coalitions which identify common ground for concerted action within the health sector as well as with all other development sectors. And within the health sector, as I said, universal health coverage and primary health care will provide the greatest convergence point. You can have pulmonologists, you can have cardiovascular people, you can have kidney specialists, you can have people who are pediatricians, psychiatrists, and others. All of them will dispute among themselves as to the priorities if we operate in narrow silos. On the other hand, when we talk about universal health coverage and primary health care, there is a great opportunity for convergence. So build those kind of platforms, but also build with other development sectors. In some conversations, we'll be the prime movers. In others, we'll be partners who are willing to listen and work with them. Frame messages, therefore, to engage diverse stakeholders from the points of their interest to build the platform for initiating conversation, moving it to consultation, consensus building, common commitment, and concerted action. But at the same time, the asks will have to be very crystal clear. There cannot be a wide range of laundry list. And therefore, when we address the policymakers, like in the case of the tobacco control movement, the asks were very simple and clear. Raise taxes, ban advertising and promotion, ban smoking in public places, have strong pictorial health warnings, and isolate industry from influencing policy. So if we build a public health movement with common concerns and consensus, then, but I also have clear asks, we are likely to get a response. We are dealing with complex systems, but we should not be deterred by complex systems. After all, antimicrobial resistance is also a complex system. So we have to have the courage and conviction to deal with this complexity. So finally, we need an action almanac. We need to assemble the agents of change to adopt an agreed agenda, to amplify advocacy, to accelerate action, and assert accountability. Ultimately, politicians too and policymakers will have to be accountable for their actions. The alternate course of apathy and inaction is untenable and unpardonable. Never before in human history have we been so forewarned of a doomed destiny if we do not adopt course correction. We have strong science for that. But never again in human history, never before again in human history, have we been so forearmed with the knowledge and tools to alter the course of that destiny. So it's a challenge to human enterprise and knowledge as to how best we use what we have in terms of our knowledge, conviction, consensus, and tools in order to ensure 
that there is affirmative climate action in order to prevent some other disasters that await us. And we need to be reminded of what Toni Morrison wrote in the Song of Solomon. If we do not create the future, the present extends itself. That is untenable. So let us create the future. Thank you.